of horror here in BBC One, evil is at work and is responsible for a string of child murders. Confront Stephen King's It in 40 minutes. First on BBC One, tonight's panorama with Nick Robinson. Tomorrow, Tory MPs vote for a new leader. You don't need a magnifying glass to see the cracks in the party. They are festering, little worms are coming out of them. For years now, they've been at war with themselves. The whole blooming lot was our fault. We brought it on ourselves. We were remarkably stupid. So are the Tories doomed to be yesterday's men? Watch the hits here, clocking up in the little hit box. The first one we're going for is Plymouth Sutton, then Exeter, you can see just beyond it there. There goes Exeter, here comes Portsmouth North, the most difficult of those targets to hit. A truly uh, terrible night for the Conservatives. Huge Labour majorities building up where those powerful Tory majorities were before. Sleazy, arrogant and incompetent. That's what Conservative Central Office told their MPs many voters had come to think of them before kicking them out of office. It was an impression that had built over five years. But instead of facing up to it, the party engaged in a bitter civil war on the one issue which really divided them, Europe. So how did the Conservatives set about destroying themselves? The story begins in 1990, on the day Margaret Thatcher was thrown out of Downing Street. John Major had been picked out by Margaret Thatcher as her successor. The challenge for him was to escape from the shadow of a woman who dominated her country and her party for more than a decade. Whilst many had simply had enough of her policies and her personality, she believed that one thing had led to her dismissal her views on Europe. To her admirers she was irreplaceable and her policies unbeatable. I think she was um, a goddess and the worshippers couldn't forgive. I remember on the night she went and I didn't want to forget. People saying we will never, we will never, we will live to regret this mistake. We will never, never recover from it. That wasn't true of course because John Major went on to win the next election and that's what I think they couldn't forgive him for. John Major's victory gave him his own mandate, but some in his party couldn't accept that. They suspected he would abandon her inheritance, a heinous crime. Whilst party workers celebrated victory, Margaret Thatcher was witnessing altogether different celebrations. The thing which always amazed me was that uh, the story which appeared in the press of a party at um, Lord McAlpine's, the former party treasurer, and uh, a, a result coming in and uh, there was a great cheer which went up and you'd think well that was another Tory uh, uh, victory not at all it was a defeat of Chris Patton of the party chairman 21,950 the Tories were on the verge of becoming two parties the Thatcherites and the rest people felt that Chris Patton was one of the sort of architects of doing in Margaret Thatcher um, so there were people definitely who were who were feeling uh, some desire for revenge against him. But I think that um, very few really thought that that was the right thing to do, uh, the right thing to say, or that, you know, um, though some people might do it as a sort of joke. I mean, people would say, people were saying Tory gain at Bath. Days after the election, the tensions emerged in public. The cause, the Maastricht Treaty. John Major saw it as a triumph for his new negotiating style. She as a sellout to Brussels. Look here, Committee of the Regents. Look, Committee of the Regents. Represent Maastricht the was, Margaret Thatcher believed, a blueprint for a United States of Europe. It could mean that a new Euro currency would replace the pound before the end of the century. Look, this is a treaty we didn't need and we didn't want. It's a treaty too far. Right, then. now let's go and have a buck swim. With the treaty due to be voted on by MPs within weeks, she urged them to vote with their conscience, not their leader. She told them, I don't believe it would bring down John Major. I don't think she deliberately wanted to create difficulties for the party. 
but she had spent her entire political career uh, stating her own mind very clearly, and particularly when she had been removed from office against her own wishes, I think she felt that there was no particular reason why she shouldn't continue to state her own views clearly. The party hadn't shown her loyalty, so she didn't need to show it loyalty. Um, put simply, there is some truth in that. That autumn, a financial crisis threatened the survival of John Major's government. The markets were selling billions of pounds. The government tried to stop them, hiking up interest rates 5% in a day. Finally, the Chancellor had to admit defeat. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. Earlier that day, ministers had been called to crisis meetings. Britain was to pull out of Europe's exchange rate mechanism. Margaret Thatcher's warnings about the ERM seemed to have been proved right. This was Black Wednesday. There were photographers, there were cameramen, there were press people. And you immediately got the sense of crisis. And I suppose it uh, reminded me of the Falklands. I felt rather like a sort of extra doctor summoned to the deathbed, you know in order to make sure the certificate was signed in proper order. With the government strategy already in tatters, John Major called in his senior ministers to ensure, as Ken Clark later put it, that we all had our hands dipped in the blood. On one side of the room sat the Prime Minister himself, flanked by his chief whip and the head of his policy unit. On the other, Michael Heseltine, Douglas Hurd, Ken Clark. When the Tory party chairman walked into the room, he noticed that one other chair was vacant. It was where the Chancellor of the Exchequer himself had recently been sitting. As I came in, um, Michael and Douglas and Ken put up this sort of low cheer, and I thought this was very odd. What are, what are they cheering about? What then became evident of what they were cheering about was that it had been decided that although uh, we, the decision had been, going, had been taken to go out of the ERM, um, that it was going to be myself who was going to appear on television that evening to explain it. Sir Norman Fowler, the chairman of the Conservative Party, is at Westminster now. Joining us now live from Westminster is Sir Norman Fowler, the chairman of the Conservative Party. I don't think it's a reverse for the government. That night, the Chancellor stayed silent. The question was how long he could keep his job. Norman Lamont was said to be in no mood to resign. But surely someone would pay for Britain's national humiliation. The Tory press were already demanding blood. The obvious thing would have been for Norman Lamont to have resigned. Why didn't he? Because Mr Major didn't tell him to and because he, um, he uh, I think to put it pompously, had a deficient sense of honour. I will not be resigning. The policy that I've been operating is the policy of the whole government. It had in fact been John Major who'd been the Chancellor when Britain entered the ERM. I think the feeling was that Either the Prime Minister and the Chancellor should resign, or neither. Certainly John Major did think seriously in the fortnight after uh, September 16 of resigning. What I don't think he felt he could do would be to ask Norman Lamont to resign or move to some lesser uh, position while he himself stayed in place. Downing Street had been mortared by the IRA. The government had its temporary headquarters in Admiralty House. Visitors there saw John Major racked by doubts about his own position. I remember him uh, walking with me to the lift, and he suddenly turned to me and, and, and in effect said, you know, do you think that I'm the right man to kind of go on doing these uh, negotiations when it comes to European negotiations with, with the other leaders? Um, my view was that he was. The Prime Minister wrote out a resignation letter, and he was uh, basically persuaded out of that by uh, Stephen Wall, his foreign affairs um, advisor. So I think he was very seriously thinking um, of uh, resignation um, itself. The Prime Minister did not resign, nor did he sack his Chancellor. A debate was now raging about whether Britain should ever have joined the ERM. John Major seemed uncertain. Not so his predecessor. The Conservative revolution went wrong by forgetting some of its own principles. Margaret Thatcher called for a fresh start. It was time to say no to the ERM, no to the single currency, and no to Maastricht, she told an American audience. 
By chance, the Chancellor was also in Washington. Looking surprisingly cheerful, he told curious journalists that he'd sung in his bath on the night of Black Wednesday. The tune, Everything's Going My Way. I was furious. I mean, I thought that he'd been pretty cavalier with the economy up to that point. Uh, but, you know, uh, to lose, but uh, it's been variously estimated between about five and 15 billion pounds for a nation. And then sing in your bath with delight. I thought it was just absolutely appalling. You make a colossal mistake, made in good faith. You know, they weren't, they weren't cheating or lying. They thought it was right. It was proved wrong. You, you have, something has to give. Something has to be explained and somebody has to say sorry. They didn't explain because they couldn't face the explanation. And they didn't apologize because they didn't feel sorry. They didn't, they didn't understand. And they continued not to understand. The Prime Minister wouldn't say sorry because that would mean turning his back on a policy he still believed in. In the wake of Black Wednesday, his poll ratings plummeted. Voters were living through a long and deep recession and they were now being told by Conservatives that the government had been to blame. At that year's Tory conference, the Thatcherite's prize fighter returned to the ring to start a punch-up on Maastricht and to reopen an old battle about the ERM. I hope, Prime Minister, that you will stand by your Chancellor. After all, it wasn't Norman Lamont's decision to enter the ERM. <laughs> he did his best to make the unworkable work. The cost in lost jobs, in bankrupt firms, repossessed homes, in the terrible wounds inflicted on industry has been savage. But we have established our credentials as good Europeans. His leader wounded, Douglas Hurd stepped in to prevent a knockout. I knew as soon as his name was called that we were going to have uh, trouble and that I would have to deal with it. And uh, after he sat down, the Prime Minister, who was sitting on my right on the platform at Brighton, passed me uh, a note, which I have. Douglas, good luck. Give him a howl. And don't worry about causing offence. John. Our party, the Conservative Party, could break itself over Europe with consequences which would deeply damage Britain and give comfort only to our opponents. Let us decide today to give that madness a miss. Whilst the Tories argued the voters were to pay for their mistakes, on Budget Day 1993, it became clear where the money would come from to pay for Black Wednesday and the government's pre-election spending spree. VAT will be charged at 8% from the 1st of April... VAT on fuel became the most unpopular tax since the poll tax. ...from the 1st of April 1995. Gone in an instant was the Tories' reputation as the tax-cutting party and a party that kept its word. And gone too, for some, was faith in John Major himself. That's when it, the truth really came out, that he wasn't Thurnard Thatcher. And before that, you thought he might have been? Well, certainly, uh, many of us voted for him on the basis that he was uh, the chosen, the chosen turn, the son and would carry out Thatcherite policy. I'm absolutely delighted today to have Norman Lamont with me. He's the architect of recovery. The architect of recovery was soon to make another remark, which he and his party would come to rue. What do you regret most, seeing that you sang in the bath on Black Wednesday or promising green shoots of recovery? Uh, I je ne regret rien. <laughs> in the words of the old song, I regret nothing. You'll see that people were laughing afterwards and we thought it was a, you know, well done, Chancellor, a nice little... Uh, a bit of repartee there, and that was it. Was Norman Lamont aware of what he'd done? No, I don't think so. I thought he, he felt that he'd given a good answer. But as I say, at the time, it did seem like a good answer. It was a, a flippant question and a flippant answer. Um, and he really didn't have a lot to regret. I mean, he just looked at the papers that morning, and there were good economic um, figures coming out all the time. But the next day, Lamont's remark was portrayed as heartless indifference. Soon after, he was sacked and joined the ranks of disgruntled Eurosceptics on the back benches. Good evening. Today's seen the electorate's first chance to pass judgment on John Major's government since last April's general election. 
Voters soon took their revenge, removing the Tories from running all but one county council. It was the Tories' worst ever election performance thus far. This is going to hit Tory MPs where it hurts. Here they come, yes. Peter Snow showed just how much it would hurt had these results been repeated in a general election. A Labour majority of 87. A Labour majority of 87? The idea seemed totally implausible. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> it's the best, it's the best act, that one. Back in the Commons, the Tories still had a majority, but in votes on Europe, that was getting steadily smaller, as more and more MPs came out as opponents of the Maastricht Treaty. I said to him, I remember very well, saying, Prime Minister, there comes a certain time in politicians' life when you know, ambition uh, isn't the most important thing, and an issue is so important to the country, and one's perspective of history says, I must fight this, um, that one will do it, whatever the whips say, and you can't force people to vote against their consciences. And this is going to cause mayhem in the party. And there was mayhem. On the night of one close vote, John Major met a group of MPs in one room to urge them to back him, whilst down the corridor, Margaret Thatcher met another group of MPs to tell them why they should vote against him. Even some ministers were expressing their sympathy with the rebels. It was the lady who eventually turned out the winner. The eyes to the right, three, one, six. The nose to the left, three, two, four. The sceptics had drawn blood. To save the treaty, John Major threatened political suicide and called a vote of confidence. The wounds opened would never fully heal. We must resolve this issue and it cannot be permitted to fester any longer. The way that the Maastricht Treaty was bludgeoned through Parliament Contrary, really, to the wishes of the Conservative Party, both in, in Parliament and outside it, really marked the start of the decline and fall of, of, of the Conservative Party. It was then, I think, that the coffin was fashioned. Uh, a lot of uh, nails were hammered into the lid later, but that, that was the start of the decline and fall, undoubtedly. Fatally damaged was John Major's relations with some in his cabinet. Off camera, he was asked why he didn't sack disloyal ministers. Well, where do you think most of this poison has come from? It's come from the dispossessed and the never possessed. You and I can both think of ex ministers who are going around causing all sorts of trouble. Do we want three more of the bastards out there? The Prime Minister was referring to three ministers who were known to be feeding unhelpful stories to journalists about the government's divisions on Europe. They'd been tracked down by checking their official diaries. These showed that they'd had lunches with reporters who'd then gone on to write stories critical of John Major. The three bastards who were identified were Michael Portillo, Peter Lilly and John Redwood. It was a label they weren't ashamed of. In a private joke, Portillo gave Lilly a glass bowl engraved with an inscription in Latin which celebrated their bastard status. Non parter sed patria, it read. No father, but fatherland. At that year's party conference, the Prime Minister wanted to start anew, to put Europe behind him, and to give his party a cause around which they could all unite, a return to old-fashioned standards. A new campaign was born. It is time to return to those old core values. Time to get back to basics. John Major had not meant to return to family values, but that's how he was interpreted. And unknown to him, some ministers had indeed been getting down to basics. Hopes of a Tory revival had ended in ridicule. By the summer of 94, the party was facing the voters still as unpopular as ever. Elections to the European Parliament mattered little to the public, but the Prime Minister's enemies warned that if the Tories won fewer than 10 seats, they'd seek to topple him. With the major years in crisis, the nation was invited to remember the Thatcher years, when she'd said no, no, no to Europe. Now she was saying no again, to party requests to help campaign. 
Lady Thatcher was happy selling books, but wasn't quite up to selling the Tory party. I tried to get Margaret to uh, take part uh, and to deliver an attack on the Liberal Democrats. Um, I mean, her re reply to that was an untypical reply for Margaret, uh, was that she was keeping a low profile, which is not uh, exactly what one uh, recalled Margaret most, uh, mo most at home doing. John Major's job was on the line, but some in his cabinet decided to keep a low profile too. Peter Lilly went on holiday to France. Did you ever express your anger to people like Margaret Thatcher and Peter Lilly who were sitting out a vital election? I think uh, a letter did go, not from me as it happened, uh, to Peter Lilly. Uh, but as far as... Um, from the Prime Minister? Uh, I think a letter did go. Uh, but so as far as uh, Margaret Thatcher was concerned, well, we, we had a talk and it was a perfectly friendly talk, uh, but it was quite clear she wasn't going to do it. But Peter Lilly was told as a minister you're expected to fight for the party cause? Well, I don't want to personalise it, and I think that all cabinet ministers uh, were expected to fight for the party cause. Massive swings against the Tories produced another record-breakingly bad result, their lowest vote since 1832. After a night like this, I find myself, and I'm sure a lot of viewers find themselves wondering whether the Conservatives can go on saying, we haven't made any mistakes, we don't need to put anything right, we don't need to change our policies in any way. But the leader would not have to change. He knew he'd done just well enough to survive. A friend recalls him moving his hand across his neck in mock relief. He'd escaped the executioner, but only just. Next to hit John Major was that word. Tory MPs were alleged to be on the take taking cash for questions or accepting lavish stays at top hotels. The behaviour of some tarnished the reputation of an entire party. They've given me a reward for coming this morning. Neil Hamilton, a junior minister, tried to laugh off stories about he and his wife's taste for generous hospitality. I shall, of course, be registering the biscuit in the register of members. In this way, sir. Is that a rich cracker, Mr Hamilton? <laughs> It was a culture at that time which said, I am a member of Parliament, I'm a member of Parliament's wife, uh, I'm important, um, and um, I deserve it. Uh, and I think that um, was a great mistake. I deserve free flights. I deserve uh, pampering. I deserve attention. And I think uh, that um, was a mistake. Tim Smith resigned as a minister after admitting taking thousands of pounds in cash stuffed in brown envelopes as consultancy fees from Mohammed Al-Fayed. Many members of parliament uh, were enjoying life and some of them became, I think, rather greedy uh, in their behaviour. It doesn't mean to say they were doing anything wrong, it wasn't corrupt behaviour, um, it wasn't dishonest, but yes, it was greedy. Now, what has happened in this little mini-general election? With another year, another Tory disaster. The Tories won just 25% of the vote and lost another 2,000 councillors. The answer is the lot. This is a prodigiously awful night for the Conservative but, but, Party, however you analyse it. The party didn't seem to recognise that they needed to do something about that uh, and to do it pretty damn quick. The euro was already being minted. Decisions on a single currency loomed. The Tories' European argument was reaching boiling point once again. The apprentice has... With discontent brewing on the backbenches, she was back, reminding Eurosceptics of the leadership they might have had. I uh, was turned out because I said to Europe, no, no, no. That no, no, no is turned into yes, yes. Demands grew for John Major to say no to scrapping the pound. He insisted there was no need to decide now. It was best to wait and see. Just weeks after the latest election setback, the Commons lobbies were buzzing. Some Tory MPs didn't trust their leaders, fearing that Kenneth Clark and Michael Hasseltine might want to join a single currency. John Major decided to meet his critics head-on. It was a very bitter and bad-tempered meeting, one has to say that. 
uh, John Major came to, into it very defensive. And when John Major's on the defensive, uh, he, uh, he does tend to be a bit abrupt and rude. And that, uh, in turn, uh, enraged other people. Was uh, there heckling of the Prime Minister? Oh, there was heckling there, certainly. He was being interrupted, uh, as, as he did that. Because, of course, he, he wasn't actually shifting his position one bit. Things had gone too far. John Major had had enough and wanted to restore control. Suddenly, he gambled his premiership. The Conservative Party must make its choice. Every leader is leader only with the support of his party. That is true of me as well. That is why I'm no longer prepared to tolerate the present situation. In short, it is time to put up or shut up. It was the bastard's moment to strike. Two years after acquiring that label, John Redwood emerged blinking into the lights. He warned his party that no change meant no chance of winning again. He was backed by the singing Chancellor and Euro rebel MPs. But where were the other bastards? There'd been talk of them resigning too. Extra phone lines were being installed for a Portillo campaign. He told friends that he'd be Britain's next Prime Minister, but then he hesitated. I speak for myself and I speak on the record when I want to say something. I've made it perfectly clear that I believe the Prime Minister is going to win in the first ballot and that he's going to have my vote. Michael Portillo been braver, do you think, as others do, that Michael Portillo could have been Prime Minister? Well, I don't know. I, all I know is that I and others at the time were telling him, no, he shouldn't, uh, you know, enter the leadership contest, really, because we, we believe, and I still believe, that, uh, you know, he who plunges the dagger never inherits the crown. For John Major, 218. For John Redwood, 89. I declare John Major elected. The wielder of the knife had indeed not won, but almost a hundred Tory MPs had crossed a line to form a rebel faction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly congratulate John Major on his victory in the leadership election. He won fair and square under the rules. And John Redwood had a new status as king of the Eurosceptics. A strong campaign. Even with the leadership settled, pressure from the sceptics didn't abate. Margaret Thatcher was celebrating her 70th birthday. She and her followers insisted that it was the government's weak line on Europe that kept it unpopular, not the divisions they were fomenting. The Tories, it was said, should learn from their past mistakes and stop trying to appease Europe. And with a year before a general election, tension was mounting even in the government. Skeptics in the cabinet said the wait and see policy on the single currency couldn't keep the party together, but ruling it out now would split the cabinet. So a new deal was agreed, a promise to hold a referendum before any decision to scrap the pound. The difficulty was this, it was necessary to, to find a sticking point, the line in the sand. Whatever. And the sticking point had to be something which everyone could live with. It couldn't be something that everyone wanted, because the Europhiles would never agree with Eurosceptics and vice versa. The difficulty was to find something that both sides would thereafter hold to. The referendum was viewed as being the final demand. Kenneth Clark carried a copy of the government's new policy in his briefcase from then on, so he could show people the price he'd extracted for agreeing to a referendum the government would not say yes or no to the single currency before a general election. It was a deal which was supposed to stop the infighting, but it was not to be. Although each time we thought we had put it to bed, we had buried it, um, it was like a dog with a bone. It would keep on going back to where the bone had been buried and digging it up again, when it would have been much more convenient for everybody, particularly those who were looking after the lawn, if it had been left alone for a bit. Sure enough, billionaire Sir James Goldsmith had a new demand, a referendum not just on the single currency, but on the whole question of Britain's involvement in Europe. 
Um, is there any chance? Just follow me as briskly as you. Within days of the Cabinet's new agreement, John Redwood paid a visit to the court of Sir James, his public agenda to persuade Goldsmith not to set up his own party and damage the Tories. But many suspected that his private agenda was to use the threat posed by Goldsmith to win more concessions from the government. A year to the general election and Tory councillors were fast becoming an endangered species. The Conservatives barely beat the Liberal Democrats. Last year we agreed the Tories weren't in a hole, they were in a bomb crater. I reckon they're still looking into the mouth of a volcano. Basildon had turned red to the horror of local Tories. Even Essex man had had enough. You had a situation where people were coming out of a very bad recession indeed. They'd lost their houses, some of them, they'd been made unemployed, or they knew people who'd lost their houses and, and been made unemployed. And they turned on the television and there were two conservative politicians arguing vehemently with each other over a subject they cared nothing about. And they thought, these people don't care about us. The Battle of Europe escalated again. The skeptics' favourite paper heralded a breakthrough. John Major had concluded that it would be against Britain's interest to join a single currency in the next five years, and it said was seeking a way to persuade Kenneth Clark to agree to ditch the wait and see policy. But some simply didn't believe that John Major could have changed so fundamentally. The Telegraph reported John Major as wanting to change the policy on the single currency. Mm. Many people said that you got that wrong. Are you still convinced? that John Major did want to change the wait and see policy. Completely convinced. Mr Major didn't pick up the telephone and say to our political editor that this is what he wants to do, but it was the next best thing. And... Um, he talked to the editor. Uh, I, I, we can't reveal our sources, but it was um, uh, quite clear that this is what he was hoping to do. Not wishful thinking on your part? No. No, it was quite clear. Downing Street denied the story. The problem was that it had come from a breakfast meeting at number 10 between the Telegraph's editor and the Prime Minister. John Major's allies insist he didn't say he wanted to change the policy, but it was too late. The fuse had been lit. The effect of that on the party was to restore morale like nobody's business. That was the time when a lot of members were off to speak to their annual general meetings and they were saying, at last we've got something to tell them, something to infuse them with, you see. If the sceptics were happy, the pro-Europeans were bound to be fuming. Just how fuming became clear at another meal with journalists. The venue, Shea Nico on Park Lane. The lunch guest, Kenneth Clark. Over lunch, the Chancellor made plain his fury with some at Conservative Central Office and Number 10. He complained that they were trying to shift the government's policy on a single currency whilst attacking him for sticking by it. The Chancellor said he got a copper-bottom guarantee from the Prime Minister that the policy wouldn't change. And if it did, he was ready to resign, taking with him a handful of junior ministers. Some, he warned, might even be prepared to resign from the Conservative Party altogether. Kenneth Clark wanted the attacks on him to stop he said he told the Tory party chairman to tell your kids to get their scooters off my lawn. Would he have resigned if the policy had changed? If the government had come to a policy which was not in the national interest, I hope King Clark would have resigned. Uh, would I'd... a policy to rule out the single currency have not been in the national interest? I think a policy to rule out the single currency forever would have been a simplistic approach to a very, very complex problem. And well worth a Chancellor's resignation. Well worth the Chancellor winning the argument against such a policy in Cabinet. So he did in that sense. The Eurosceptics are right. Have the Prime Minister by the throat. I don't think it was the throat that they used to say, but certainly a part of the anatomy. John Major's attempt to woo the Telegraph had backfired. Both wings of the party now suspected him of telling them what they wanted to hear. It looked like all tactics and no strategy. I recall um, a meeting that, uh, a private meeting I had with him with a number of uh, Eurosceptics and I remember him saying, I am the biggest Eurosceptic of them all. And uh, of course we felt we were winning the argument and in the tea room, the following day or the day after, 
one was tending to rib some of the Europhiles in the party and say, oh, you're losing, the Prime Minister's on our side now, and they said, what? He came to dinner with us last night, and he was telling no way was he going to be f pushed around by the Eurosceptics. Uh, the, he would, believed he'd been at the heart of Europe. John Major's allies accuse his critics of wishful listening. He had become more hostile to the single currency, they say, but still passionately believed it would be wrong to rule out joining it. Wait and see would remain party policy. Good afternoon. The phony war is now over. The election campaign proper will begin after Easter. The time had come to face the country. John Major decided that a long campaign would give time to focus on what he'd really achieved and not on party divisions. But it was not to be. Within the first two weeks of our long campaign, we saw the resignation of a former minister as a candidate. Um, Alan Stewart, after he'd met her, a, a woman in a trying out clinic. Another former minister, Tim Smith, resigned as a candidate after admitting that he'd taken cash in brown envelopes. The chairman of the Scottish Conservative Party, Mickey Hurst, um, was a victim of a most disgraceful and scurrilous smear campaign. Then, I think, Two or three days later, a Conservative backbencher, Piers Merchant, uh, was caught in a, in a tabloid clinch uh, with a 17-year-old nightclub hostess. That was what Conservative Central Office had had to deal with before Europe reared its head again. Over 200 Tory candidates had used their election addresses to come out against a single currency. Ministers were supposed to stick to wait and see but could they be relied upon? No, John Horham and another colleague had got the line wrong. But you have embarrassed the Prime Minister, haven't you, sir? Are you the with Horham? How many other ministers are there like you? Central Office was sure the ministers would have to go. Shouldn't you take John Horham? Can I get a picture with you inside? He said it was very difficult to, um, to sack two ministers in the middle of a general election campaign. It will cause huge problems with the right of the party. And um, besides, we had, there was no saying how many other government ministers there might be out there um, who have strayed from the government line. John Major made one final and dramatic plea for his approach to Europe. Trust me, he said, I'll get the best for Britain. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, like me or loathe me, don't bind my hands when I am negotiating on behalf of the British nation. But it was too late and he knew it. The election had merely highlighted the scale of Tory divisions on Europe. The party couldn't stop fighting. It sometimes seemed to me that it had become high on conflict. High on conflict, what do you mean? Um, it, it, was like a, it was like a drug, having um, become so used to um, internal in, infighting that um, it was, uh, you know, they were hooked on it. There it is, 10 o'clock, and we say, Tony Blair is to be Prime Minister and a landslide is likely. Five years on and four and a half million fewer votes. The party's wounds, which John Major had set out to heal, were rawer than ever. So right, OK, we lost. So <laughs> we... <laughs> Go on, John. <laughs> There clearly were some people in the last parliament who actually consciously wanted to go into opposition, to go off into the desert to beat themselves with scorpions, tails and thongs and come back purged and purified uh, to lead the next glorious stage of the revolution. I think when history looks back, if it does at this particular period, it'll see a black hole in the history of the Conservative Party. A time without leadership, without direction and nothing. <laughs> As the Tories choose their new leader, they are, it seems, still prisoners of their history. Many still wait to hear who Margaret Thatcher will choose, even seven years after she fell. John Major was the leader she chose before. He said he was the glue which held the party together. The glue came unstuck. <laughs> 